All right, it is a big few days for Mayo football. There's the small matter of an All-Ireland semi-final against Dublin on Saturday and also a major fundraising initiative been taken on by the former Mayo captain and two-time All-Star Dermot Flanagan in aid of the oncology unit at Mayo University Hospital. In 2017, Dermot was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, an aggressive form of blood cancer. He underwent treatment throughout 2018 and thankfully is now in full remission. But he's organised a side for eight straight days that will begin this Saturday and end the following Saturday and will visit every GEA club ground in the county of Mayo beginning in his home ground of Balahadreen GEA club it'll cover over 430 kilometres in total it is the great Mayo team of 96, 97 coming together uh, to do this cycle and if you want to get involved and raise much needed funds you can get on to gofundme.com search for cycle for Mayo hospital oncology unit I'm delighted that Dermot Flanagan is with us this evening how are you keeping Dermot? Good, Nathan. Just uh, doing the final preps for the uh, big day on Saturday, and that's nothing to do with Mayo playing Dublin. Are you doing all seven days? I'm doing all eight days, Nathan, Oof. yeah. And um, that's my commitment. I think symbolically, um, I came up with this idea to visit every J pitch. <clears throat> and, you know, if I kicked a point when we visit every pitch, I might be, uh, I might have a record. You certainly might. Uh, it's uh, so, something worth uh, trying out. Why not? I'm sure it'll be a good warm welcome for you everywhere you go. You're you're bringing that team of, of 96, 97 that got back to back to back all Ireland finals of David Brady and Lee McHale and Larry Finnerty and all these lads. Are, are you the type of group that this is a regular thing that you get together for reunions all the time? No, Nathan. Would you believe in the since since that those great two years and a wonderful group of uh, of uh, people. Uh, searching for the dream. We haven't ever had a, a formal get together as such. So 25 years later, we're all still alive. And we had talked a little bit about doing something. There are occasionally um, some uh, um, events like uh, presenting as a Connock final or something, but in terms of something for ourselves. And uh, I came up with this idea um, as somebody who's got a second chance at life through modern medicine. And um, everyone is, is fully supportive of it. All the lads are involved, the management, John Mahon, Peter Ford, Tommy O'Malley, Jamie Rogers, who is our Dublin-based trainer. So a tremendous response, not just from the lads, but from the clubs fully supporting us. And um, of course, it's all in a good cause. She's looking at John Mahon these days. He's still as fit as ever. I'd say he could do all eight days, no bother to him. Yeah, we'll be letting John at the front. I'll be staying at the back, <laughs> Nathan, just with some of the other lads. Uh, and if we let John and Collie McMenamin and a few of those guys, they'll probably swim to Clare Island and, and have a sprint up Crow Patrick before they start cycling. Yeah, yeah. I'd say avoid McHale because you don't want to be beside the tan and avoid David Brady because he'll just never shut up. That's 100%. Uh, it is for a, a very worthwhile cause, as you say, but also something that's obviously very close to your heart. And, you know, I guess when you ask, how are you? When people ask you now after what you've been through over the last two, three years, it has a deeper meaning when people ask how you are. They, they really want to know because you've been through, uh, obviously, a hell of a lot. Yeah, I, I'm well. And uh, I, I just want to say to, to, especially to all the guys out there, you know, I, I had a bump in my groin. I, I got it checked out. Uh, but the one thing was I was persistent and so were my doctors and uh, I had scans that didn't show up anything. My GP, Dr. John blenner Hassett, was persistent, uh, had the biopsy, it showed up the aggressive uh, cancer cells and uh, I was straight in for treatment uh, under Professor John McCaffrey. But one of the messages I'd like to get out, now I've said this publicly before, Nathan, is, you know, we, we sometimes as men, we get anxious, but sometimes we don't get ourselves checked out. I was lucky they got it in stage one and it gave me the best possible chance. And, and the doctors all said that they gave me the best possible chance because of the early detection. And I just encourage everybody and the oncology unit in Castle Bar, tremendous support there. Dr. Greg Leonard and, and uh, Dr. Kevin Barry, uh, the oncologist and oncology surgeon. They're delighted that as part of Cancer West that Castle Bar has the same quality of treatment as Galway or anywhere else. And they're delighted that perhaps we're giving just a little bit of attention to the fact that the, the best of treatment is in Castle Bar. Mm. It must have been a heck of a shock when you did finally get that diagnosis. 
it is because firstly there's diagnosis for those and I'm very conscious there will be those who are living with cancer at the moment or have a loved one who has or a different circumstances but you firstly get the news that you have a diagnosis of the word cancer and um, uh, then there's a qu the question of uh, meeting somebody to say what stage is it at and what's the treatment available and um, there are a lot of questions um, notwithstanding anyone's education it can be a sea of emotions and there's the waiting around there's four to six weeks to find out what exactly is the diet prognosis and how are you going to be treated and then there's the journey of treatment and um, all I can say to you is I, I feel I feel fortunate modern medicine was involved here Nathan mm. one of the drugs uh, is in immunotherapy it's only uh, out 15 years and um, indeed, by coincidence, my sister Joy was involved in bringing that drug to the market. And um, so modern science, the treatment wasn't as difficult as um, my uncle and aunt had this uh, in the past, Nathan. Um, I'm told it's not hereditary, it's more environmental. But nonetheless, uh, I remember my uncle going through treatment. It was far more heavy. Um, I did eight treatments of chemotherapy, came through it. Then there's the ongoing reviews and um, being kept under watch. Uh, and I'm thankful now, nearly three and a half years later, um, I'm well. Um, and the COVID experience as well was something that I, I was thinking a lot about. And I thought, what better opportunity done to get back out exercising and, and doing something good as well. So a lot of things, a lot of, uh, there's been a journey for me in the last um, three years. Yeah. Um, as I said to the players, 25 years ago, we were on the battlefield of sport at this stage in our lives it's it's the battlefield of life and uh, and these are some of the challenges and we're also conscious that indeed even within our own group um we have a loved one who um who has had a recurrence of of cancer and is going through difficult circumstances so we're thinking a lot about all of that and uh, really we're, we're we're also giving something back to the community nathan we had a great time for two years um searching for the dream uh, and I, as the son of the last captain to win, it was my dream. But nonetheless, you know, you learn a lot in life off the field of play. And what we're doing right now uh, is all about life and yeah. all about uh, trying to. And 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 really, it's a great thing. And and the lads have shown the same spirit, Nathan, in this next eight days as they did in the two years that I had the privilege to play with them in '96 and '97. Well, we saw in '96, one in, all in was the motto of that team. Yes, and, and a tremendous a tremendous group of people and all of them in life, they have a tremendous energy and uh, we're looking forward to the eight days. We're also um, looking forward to our reunion on day eight and uh, we're going to have a nice gathering uh, on the eight, uh, on the, at the end of the eighth day, job done and uh, there'll be lots of stories and um, I hope, uh, Nathan, on the way around, I can tell a few stories about the pitches and my experience on the pitches Great. Uh, of, of Mayo. Uh, perhaps things that I wasn't able to say 25 years ago, but I hope the statute of limitations means I can uh, say some of these things. Mostly it's about good fun, great experiences, life's experiences. You mentioned there, you know, you're conscious of people who may be going through a, a similar journey at the moment. And, you know, that battlefield on the football pitch was somewhere where you flourished. That battlefield of life, when you were going through this over the last couple of years, how did you cope? Were you somebody who was very open and able to talk with your family and uh, be free with your emotions and, and what a shock this was and how difficult a process it was to deal with? Were there times where actually you went into yourself and you, and you wish maybe you were more open? Can you, can you talk a bit about that? Um, Georgie Crawford, who you may know, Nathan and I, we did the Strictly Come Dancing a couple of years ago and I was talking to her and she used this phrase. I said, Georgie, you got to dig deep. You got to dig deep into yourself. And and all of the qualities perhaps that you, you had on a football field, they're the same qualities you have to access when you're going through difficult times. And um, and um, in my case, um, I, I was open about it. Uh, to the extent that you can be, um, there is mixtures of anxiety, fear and emotion. But I think it's awfully important, Nathan, that you find somebody to talk to about these things. And might I also say, in the same way that I was in lockdown uh, for about nine months during treatment because of the concerns of infections and things like that. And in a way, that's the same experience we've all had during COVID. And all I could say is that in my, I, I was happy enough to, I'm happy to tell you, Nathan, that during my journey through chemotherapy, I did uh, reach out to a psychotherapist about my own mental journey. 
And I'm happy to say that because um, it's time for us as men, especially to be able to reach out to somebody to talk about things. And um, a, a colleague of mine uh, took his life a couple of weeks ago, uh, Nathan, and that's a shock to the system. So all I'd say to people as well is there's tremendous help for people um, but you've got to reach out. You've mm. got to dig deep. But also at times, if, if you're struggling in yourself, there's amazing support and help from outside the family. And really, it's just a question of asking. There are so many people who point you in the right direction. And um, I think the COVID as well, Nathan, reminded me of the time when I was in a form of isolation um, to, to, to get healthy again. And uh, it reminded me of that. Um, and I'd be very conscious of the fact that we've all been affected by this lockdown. Yeah, because, you know, being such a legend of the football field and such a legend of Mayo football, there's almost a, an impression from the outside that, you know, you types are, you're, you're bulletproof almost, whereas clearly it's just not the case. It, it, it's not. And um, you, 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 you realise, firstly, you have a resilience, but you also realise the vulnerability of, um, the, the, in a sense, that life changes in an instant and on the other hand nathan um somebody asked me afterwards you know at this stage in full remission what did you learn from your illness and and what i learned is that it's really important in life to surround yourself with people that give you positivity that are positive for you and that was a lesson that i um, learned in life um, uh, make sure that the people that you 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 share your time with and um as i sometimes say now use your time wisely um i that's a, an expression that, that i've introduced in my own working life now that i'm back to work uh, let's use our time wisely and uh, and hope that when we're with people we will use our time wisely yeah, and look here, if anyone's listening in and they're having some difficulties at the moment, you can always ring the Samaritans, as we know. We mentioned it all the time, 116123 for anyone out there. Your own uh, career and your own life, uh, Dermot, is fascinating because, you know, you mentioned your dad, Sean, the last Mayo man, to lift Sam Maguire, the captain of the team in 50, 51. Like when people talk about greatest Mayo men, your dad's name is is always on the list because of what he's done as a footballer and, you know, being that captain and being the cornerback and the team of the century and the team of the millennium, but away from football, this hugely influential politician, Minister for Health in the 60s under Jack Lynch. What was he like as a father? Um, a fantastic, very interesting man. Um, somebody who treated you with equality. Um, he, ha he was a scholar in philosophy and logic, curiously. He studied for the priesthood. That didn't go very well for him, obviously. The only thing that did was deny him the chance to, to play for the Mayo Miners in Croke Park when he was in Clonliffe College. But um, anyway, life moved on. He met my, met my mother. But he was a very interesting man. He was a very deep thinker about life in general. That thinking was shown on the field of play. He was regarded as being a, a brilliant leader, a brilliant tactician, somebody who studied the opposition very well. His own team in the 50s, 51, they went into a hotel for two weeks into collective training in advance of the All-Ireland finals and All-Ireland semi-finals. So they were way above their uh, what was being done at the time. Um, he had tremendous ambition in life, um, a, a deep sense of humanity, and uh, a very interesting person. Um, the realities of life growing up with a politician and somebody who was in government for nearly 10 years is that he's busy, and my mother was busy. Uh, so as a result, I'm one of seven, and we're all very close because as you know, teenagers and growing up, we had a lot of support systems, aunts and uncles who supported us with a, with parents who were involved in, in the running of the country. Yeah. And um, my father was involved in the 60s where Sean Lamass and people like that were, were his great inspire, inspirational heroes who wanted Ireland to reach out into the world, going one side to Europe, the other side to the United States. And in some respects, we, we owe a lot to these people because um, 25% of our employment directly and indirectly is foreign direct investment. I know about this because um, I've represented the IDA in the past. I've been privileged to do that. Uh, on the other hand, my, my father's last 10 years in politics were in Europe. And likewise, he wanted Ireland to play a, a bigger part in Europe. And he was part of a, a, a group in the 80s. And it wasn't just Fianna Fáil politicians. He was part of a group, Mark Clinton, Paddy Cooney, Liam Kavna, all um, cross party who were working for Ireland in the 80s and 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 opening up Ireland to, to where it is today, a, a, a European, modern, vibrant, 
um, uh, society, with, of course, the challenges that come with, with modern society as well. We, we can't forget that. How much stock did he hold when you were growing up in those All-Ireland medals? Were they front and centre in your house? Were, was that something that he, he constantly looked back on with huge pride and, and wanted to reminisce and get nostalgic about? Or was it just one part of a life's journey and then he was on to something else? It was a mixture, you, you said, part of a journey. Um, he, one of his regrets was that after his team finished in 56, uh, in 30 years until I won my first Connacht title, Mayo only won three Connacht titles. And it was a regret to him that there wasn't any legacy, and there wasn't any continuation after his team finished. Um, it was a huge regret to him. He saw many fine players in the 60s and 70s never get to grace Croke Park. And really his ambition was that we would, that Mayo as a, as a county would set the standard in Gaelic football. Um, he saw himself as somebody who was privileged to have an, an amazing and gifted group of players and he knew full well they were capable of winning uh, all Ireland's. His regret was perhaps that they could have won more, but be that as it may, the history shows they won two all Ireland's, two national leagues, five Connacht kind of titles. Um, but his real interest was in uh, why Mayo didn't succeed in, in, in maintaining its standards. I'm glad to say, through my knowledge, I played with James Horn, and I'm glad to say that in the 80s, when we came through, he made a breakthrough in 85. I won seven Connacht titles in 13 years, and I believe in its own way, we got we got more used to travelling to Croke Park, and when you get to Croke Park, you see the standards that are set by others, and you, you seek to reach them, and uh, that continued into the 2000s, and we've now an exceptional group who have made Mayo um, a, a team that's regarded as being in the top four or six every year. But that takes huge work, and I know that the current James Horan has done an extraordinary work to yeah. bring the current transitional group into the level of performance. But it's ongoing. I know that Liam Moffat, the chairman, has in recent years has um, revolutionised the management structures, and it's all about making us best at standard and uh, we have a development you know the whole development squad ethos um, uh, so there's a lot that goes into high level sport and it's becoming more sophisticated year by year did you ever ask him about the curse um he never mentioned it so i want to reassure everybody <laughs> i played from 82 to 97 at senior level i didn't know about the curse right Hat um, on. and it was never in my mind in the last 10 minutes of the game paddy prendergast who is the sole surviving yeah. member, spoke to me about it and said, yes, they were in Foxford on the evening and yes, they were celebrating. Nobody told them there was a funeral because if if, there, if they had known, they would have paid their respects. Um, did the parish priest say what he's alleged to have said? I really am not so sure. But all I can tell you, Nathan, is it was never in my consciousness. You mentioned Paddy Prendergast there being the one surviving member of that team and like there's such mystique as you would expect around 1951 and the stories and like there was that brilliant documentary where Aidan O'Shea goes over to America and meets the Flying Doctor, meets Paul Carney and like there's just a warmth to the story. Like, would you have had an opportunity and maybe you were so young at the time you didn't you know realise how long Mayo would have to wait and how important 1951 is, would, would you have sat down with your dad and like you know, pick through what happened in 50 and 51 and wanted to know all the stories and sort of know how their day went on All-Ireland Final Day and what happened with the celebrations and, and just everything that happened around those great teams. Very much so. And, and I spent, I was probably because of, I was one of seven, but six of the family spent time abroad. So I was the one who stayed at home. It was Dublin, Ballahead, Derry and all the time. And I spent so much time with my dad and, and my mother, uh, Patricia. And really, I, I, I got to really know what happened there. And um, I had the privilege of Paddy Prendergast, Damon Mongi, Pori Kearney visiting our home, Joe Gilvary. We visited them on a regular basis. Firstly, you would all, when you met them, you, 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 could, you could feel the sense of passion, the sense of character, the sense of personality in these people. It was quite clear that these people were going to succeed in life beyond the football field. Um, my father really brought these people together. He made them believe um, that they could set a standard, and they did. But they were very special people. Uh, my father was very analytical about sport. He always felt that winning games was a was a, a clinical exercise in knowing your own game, knowing the oppositions, and, and having a, a determination to win. And one of the features of that team was uh, they simply refused to accept defeat. 
And this was one of the great characters of the team. And I had the privilege of knowing many of these people in their ordinary lives later. Eamon Mongi was a colleague of mine in the Law Library. What a gifted man and one of the most competitive golfers I ever played golf with. Paddy Prendergast, when you meet Paddy, he simply oozes personality and character. And um, what I learned from them is that their journey in football was like their journey in life. They worked really hard to become the successful team and they were they were brave uh, they really asked themselves hard questions there was an honesty about them and of course my father was probably the most honest he didn't uh, like any great military leader he, he asked nobody to do uh, anything that he wouldn't do himself but there was that sense of these people who knew there was something special going on but they did work tremendously hard to achieve their objective so you don't get the sense that they were a tremendously emotional bunch that when the final whistle went they weren't all on their knees in tears it was we came here to do a job and we did it and um, they expected to win yeah and 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 that was their way and uh, they believed when they went to Croke Park, they were better than any other team. So there was no fear for them. Yeah. Where are... The story in 51, the Mead team were unable to get out of their own dressing room. So um, the Mayo team were told that the Mead team would be walking through their dressing room uh, and out onto the field. And immediately my father called him to attention and said, under no circumstances would they uh, uh, address any of the Mead players or look them in the eye. There was a jo- in other words, there was a job to be done. It wasn't the time for Hail Fellow Well Met. But I can tell you that uh, post the football field, my father had the best of friends in Mead, Cavan, Kerry. Uh, my father never lost a championship match to Kerry. Right. That's not a bad record so, to have. So, but the, the bonds with, with Paddy Bond, Brosnan and uh, so, uh, some of the Kerry players, the bonds with the Mead players, Frankie Byrne, some of these wonderful, wonderful characters, those bonds lasted well into life. And uh, I remember visiting Mick, famous the Hat Higgins, the Gunnar Brady, the famous Cavan player, who was a guard in Castle Blaney. Um, and, you know, these were very, very special men. They were characters in their own way. And, and they had similar personalities and they were great friends of my father's Jerry O'Malley from Roscommon just they were great people great characters I had the privilege of meeting them too In terms of growing up then as Sean Flanagan's son and the pressure that would come with that as you're starting to become a footballer and become known uh, you spent most of your early years actually in Dublin so you grew up because your dad was the politician and would have been based out of Dublin you wouldn't have spent a huge amount of time in Mayo as, as, a, as a child as a teenager Yes, I went to Belgrove National School in Clontarf and then I went to the same school as Jack McCaffrey's father, Noel, and all the McCaffrey lads. Uh, we all went to Ross Mini College in Drumcondra. At that stage, I played with Clontarf Club and then I moved to Rohini Gales in the in the teenage years. And um, I was going back on back to Ballyhadrine during the summers and enjoying my time and to my grandfather out the road from where you come from in Ballyhonas. And uh, so I still remained connected and we were up and down. But in a sense... The big call came at 17 when um, the Dublin Miners were were advancing and they were looking for players. And I had a good discussion with my father and um, he said, you know, you have the option of Mayo. And I said, I know that. And uh, he said, would, you, would I go down? And I was very happy to do so. So you were playing your club football Im- at the time with Clontarf? I was with Clontarf until under, under 13 and I joined Rohini Gales then as under 14 where my brother John was was playing in goal and, and my brother John was a very distinguished footballer himself, won a, a county title with, with Rohini Gales and represented the army for many years in goal and uh, not to be, you know, and, and we, 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 we had a really just a strong yeah. upbringing. But um, really the key question at 17 was, um, where what would I do? And I went down to Brafie, Austin Garvin, the then All-Ireland minor winning manager the previous year gave me a lovely welcome. And that was very important, Nathan. The lads gave me a lovely welcome. Liam Lyons from Ahamore came over to me after the trial match and uh, introduced himself and knowing my grandparents. And uh, I just felt welcome straight away. But I should say, Nathan, for those who go the long road, I did the long road. I, it's fair to say I played as a right half forward to everyone's surprise, maybe, as a minor. I underperformed. I was a little bit small. Um, I grew uh, two and a half inches and put on three stone. Um, by the age of 20, I was six foot and 13 and a half stone. UCD was very good to me. But a key moment for me was the great Eugene McGee, manager of the Offaly All-Ireland winning team, was managing UCD. And in nine, and when I was 19, he switched me from number 10 uh, to number five, right half back. And I immediately realised 
I could do all the attacking, but I could mark a man, I could anticipate what's happening. And that was the opening of the door for me, Nate. Right. My whole world in football switched and um, I moved on to play. I started my career at senior level at Mayo, playing at uh, left half back. And within a year, I was back in, in the same position as my, hmm. as my father, Sean. But another significant feature is that within a short period of starting to play for Mayo, that the people of Mayo recognised me in my own right. And, and that's very important for a son and um, started in 82 and, and by 1985 I'd won an All-Star but more importantly I think the people of Mayo um, saw Dermot Flanagan in his own right and uh, before Keith Higgins came along uh, the people of Mayo selected Sean Flanagan um, and Dermot Flanagan as the, the best two cornerbacks in the county. Of course I have to doff my hat to Keith Higgins uh, uh, one of the greatest cornerbacks of all time uh, in the country and uh, isn't it great we have uh, three three players the, the, with with such strong links to Ballyhonas and uh, Ahamore, uh, uh, you know, coming, you know, representing uh, to the highest standard, um, uh, Mayo at number four. I was going to say, technically, you're all from Ballyhonas. Uh, you know, the Ballahadreen yeah. thing is just a sideshow. So did you did you tr- transfer then to Ballahadreen and come and play club football with Ballahadreen and travel down I from did, Dublin? And I did, and it was it was time, as it were, to come home. I remember having a chat with John O'Mahony, and uh, it was fantastic. And uh, I, I, I just, just the minute I got back, I just embraced it. I was still under twenty one. We had a fantastic under twenty one team. So did you live in Ballahadreen? Where they, where the county lads, Noel won in All Ireland in eighty three with Mayo, and um, it was the beginning of something special. We won, I think, three leagues in five seasons. We were one of the top teams in in Mayo, and and there were a great few years. And um, then I qualified as a barrister, and I joined civil service. I. Uh, f- six great seasons with them. I was captain in 92 when we won the league and got to the county final. I played a couple of seasons back with Clontarf and then um, I had a cruciate injury in 93. I was out of football for 18 months and at the age of 33, John Mahon took over and um, I was asked back. Yeah. Uh, and that was the beginning of another journey and a, a big call uh, was, I go- was I prepared to, to take a chance and, and go back and uh, I'm glad I did. Yeah, and just that passing of the baton you talked to of you know being recognized as yourself as Dermot Flanagan the Mayo player and the Mayo supporters embracing that and and not just looking at you as as your father's son like is that a conversation when your dad's asking you do you want to play for Mayo or do you want to play for Dublin like is that a deep conversation of what place means and what Mayo means and what Dublin means is that is that a long thoughtful conversation where you're figuring out where the rest of your life leads uh, no, Nathan. I mean, when you're brought up with Sean Flanagan as captain, and funny, the late and great Paddy O'Shea mentioned this. He said, "Dermot, you're the only person who grew up with a with a father who who captained Mayo to two All Irelands. Has anyone ever sought to use that information?" Um, and that's an interesting question. But for me, all of my culture and my DNA was Mayo football, and um, so for me, this was a very easy decision. Don't forget. I'm from Ballahadreen. I was born there. Um, moving to Dublin, I'm told I, I, I had very unparliamentary language when I was informed at the age of five that we were moving to Dublin. But we, but by the age of 10 or 11 or 12, I was going back. Uh, the Towie family, the great Matty Towie and Annie and all of their, um, and indeed Ger is married, Geraldine is married to John O'Mahony. They welcomed me with open arms. I used to stay with them on a regular basis. And uh, really the bonds were, 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 never, were never cut. Um, so for me to go back home, as it were, at 17, 18, and uh, I can tell you, Nathan, I met some marvellous characters at minor football. And to, for me, I was a relatively shy guy, probably fair to say. I can talk now, but to meet characters like Joe Lindsay from Bangor Eris and the kind of life he had, saving the turf during the day, having a bit of dinner, going off training, going off to a dance, then looking for salmon in the river. And, you know, this a long was, way from Clontarf. That was a long way from Clontarf, I can tell you, Nathan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Great characters. And if there's one thing that I, I feel I've been privileged, the character and the personality of people from Mayo, north, south, east and west. And I've been privileged to, 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 to share that um, sense of passion for life. I think football for me and, and the, the love of football is part of the sense of community. And that sense of community is so loud and clear because this journey 
we're starting cycling on Saturday, the people of Mayo have embraced this journey as well. And there just is a great sense of community, which which is wonderful. And the response has been the same for my cycle as perhaps not quite, but the same sense of perspective. Um, we're doing something for the hospital and we hope the Mayo team will do something else for us on Saturday evening against Dublin. Yeah, uh, we are tight in time. We're definitely going to ask you back again, Dermot, to go through your own Mayo career. And as you say, 89, 96, 97, even going back in the 85 semi-final against Dublin and all the controversy of that game, there's plenty of stories in that that we'll hopefully come back to over the next few months. Um, yes. But just a well, quick thanks. word. Cause, cause I, so I, much, Nathan. I often get uh, a lot of stick, Dermot, you know, that it's two days before Mayo against Dublin and we have a Mayo man. But you're really, like, we couldn't have got somebody more in the middle than yourself to have on. What's your thoughts? Because there's a feeling that Dublin are on the decline, that they haven't been at it, that they're not crushing teams like they were, and maybe this is Mayo's opportunity. What's your sense? It, it's it, it's always an opportunity, and I know that this current Mayo team see this as an opportunity. They'll go head-to-head. -head. Uh, Dublin probably don't have the bench they had, um, but they're still a, a super powerful team. And um, no matter what, they will have a huge pride in themselves. So today is a day for stepping up, it's a day for growing and uh, we'll find out the second half against Galway needs to be repeated for at least 60 minutes and the other 10 minutes has to be um, a, 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 another standard, simply upping the standard. Um, if I could say this, Nathan, uh, a military leader once said the following, you can never choose your battlefield, God does that for you, but you can plant a standard where a standard never flew. And my wish for this Mayo team is to plant the standard on Saturday, not just for Saturday, but for the All-Ireland final. And there's a lot going to be happening on Saturday. There's a big Mayo crowd coming to Dublin for that match, but I'm sure there's going to be a big crowd as well around all the grounds in Mayo next week. You're starting on Saturday with this cycle, over 430 kilometres in total, starting in Ballahadreen, moving through East Mayo and all the way around the county over the following eight days before you get to have that big reunion of the 96 97 team uh, before I let you go I know it's going to be a battleground in my house about uh, Mayo Dublin what about the next generation then of the Flanagans are you having the same conversation with your own son about Dublin Mayo is he going to be making that pilgrimage back to Ballahadreen as well and pulling on the green and red yeah, well I've, I've twins Jack and Amelia they both play Gaelic football and um, both uh, Amelia has other gifts uh, acting and X and I should say that she's already been on RTE in a programme so important to, to say that but uh, Jack, yeah, Jack is 16. He uh, plays with Clontarf, for a Division One team. Yes, he's a gift, uh, and uh, he's currently learning a little bit with the with the Dublin development squad. Oh, no. But it's a journey. Uh, he will have the option in his own time of making his decision. Um, he's very proud of his roots. He played with Balahaderian in 2018, a few games when I was sick and he was available. So um, the uh, the DNA runs deep. But you know, sometimes as a parent, and my, my Sean would agree with this, my his grandfather, sometimes you have to get out of somebody's way. And sometimes as a parent, I, I made the important decision uh, this summer to step away from direct coaching of Jack because he has to go on a learning curve himself. And uh, that's what all the, the good coaching manuals say. There's time to step away and let your son uh, learn his trade himself. And who knows? He might even be far better than me or his grandfather. Well, he'd be doing all right if he is, yeah. Put him in touch with Andy Moore and managing Balahadreen at the moment and get the process uh, underway. Uh, Dermot, uh, been brilliant to chat to you. As I say, get on to GoFundMe.com, search for Cycle for Mayo Hospital Oncology Unit, make a donation, say it's all going towards that Mayo Hospital Oncology Unit. Uh, Dermot Flanagan, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, Nathan, and thanks everybody for your support and good wishes. And uh, um, uh, regardless of the outcome on Saturday evening, uh, we'll be doing a good thing for, for, for life itself. So thanks, Nathan. Best of luck with it, Dermot.